Okay, we are attempting to conclude our study of the book of Judges, and we are in um, chapter 20, and the Israelites have uh, gone into civil war. All the tribes are battling against uh, Benjamin, and um, because of the sin of the sons of Belial from Gibeah, who wanted to know that Levi, and because he wasn't allowed to uh, do that, he was given the Levi's concubine, and they abused her, and she died from the abuse. And the Levi cut her into 12 pieces and sent her throughout the nation. And uh, uh, I probably shouldn't spout off since I didn't directly look at that in the context for today, but uh, how many pieces did it cut her in? Twelve. Oh. So when you anticipate Benjamin would have received a, a delivery yeah. concubine? Yes. Uh, evidently they didn't have the same reaction to it that the other tribes did. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but that just kind of crossed my mind. Um uh, and so the, the battle's taking place. We finally got to the turning point where they address God properly and uh, not only ask uh, instructions to go up, but uh, are, are distraught about their present condition. And they're weeping over what's happened with the, uh, their brethren having died in battle, and they really want to know what to do. And uh, uh, they get the priest to intercede for them, which is the way God designed for it to be to begin with. And um, so now that they've approached God in the proper way and asked the proper questions and uh, conditioned themselves to do what God <coughs> wants to do, then God's answer is different. He not only said, go up, but he said, tomorrow I will deliver them into thy hand. He hasn't told them that before. And um, so Israel set liars in wait around Gibeah. What does this sound like to you? That's a pretty good strategy, you know. And now that they're tuned in with God... Um, and now that they've been defeated twice, uh, they thought, well, uh, Gibeah may have the same response, and the tribe of Benjamin may have the same response that other people have had in the past when they think they've been successful. Mm-hmm. If we pretend like they're successful again, they've defeated us twice, then maybe they'll pursue after us, and we'll have liars in wait. To, uh, so at least there's some wisdom behind these tribes now going to God and now uh, using a tactic that have been extremely successful. Um, because God used it the first time, didn't he? And AI, he's the one that told them to use that. Uh, so now they seem to really be tuned in. Since we're going to talk to God, let's use one of God's plans. And um, it's worked before, multiple times. Um, and um, it appears here that Benjamin doesn't have a real good memory. Excuse me. You'd think them being part of the Israelites and have experienced this kind of procedure before that they'd say, ah, that's not going to work with us. Uh, But they seem to fall right into it, like people typically do. Um, You know, when we are promised in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 by the Lord that he will, with every temptation, provide a way to escape, you know, it means we have to pay attention. Sometimes we don't see the way of escape because they're not looking. And, uh, uh, Benjamin uh, not paying attention here, and uh, the Israelites set the trap for him, and uh, for the people of Gibeah, and they uh, they rout them and do what typically is done. They um, not only defeat them in battle, but they destroy their city, and uh, they came against Gibeah, ten thousand chosen men out of all of Israel, verse thirty-four, and they did. Uh, we're in the battle sore. They hot in the heat of battle. And uh, and then um, the 25,000 and 100 men, all these drew the sword. The children of Israel destroyed those, that number of the Benjamites. How many did we start out with? 26,000 plus 700 <coughs> slingmen, mm-hmm. left-handed slingmen. Um, and so, Wow. They killed 20 and 5 and 100 men. Uh, uh, 25,000 
and 100 men at your sword. So we stand it down in a hurry. Uh, so the children of Israel saw that they were spitting, for the men of Israel gave place uh, uh, to the Benjamites because they trusted in the liars in wait, which they had set beside Gibeah. And so it worked, and they made haste, and uh, came up from the arrears and took the, the city. And when the Gibeonites looked back and saw the great flame of smoke rise up from the city, and the men of Israel retired in the battle, Benjamin began uh, to smite and uh, kill the men of Israel, about 30 persons. Well, they say, surely they are smitten down before us as it is in the first battle. You see, they fell for the, uh, the trap again. And when they get out of the city and they chase the Israelites and they turn again and men of Benjamin are amazed. Now, why would you be amazed when you've been a part of this before? You see, when you don't rehearse your history and you don't take things seriously, then you have a generation that doesn't remember and, uh, and you fall for the same old things. When we had that discussion earlier about this sin of homosexuality, and we have uh, a generation of people who've grown up, they don't know what the Bible teaches. They don't have any idea of the context of, of that sin. They would have not a clue. But you said God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. That'd be foreign to them. Um, and so when that happens, guess what? You're going to commit the same kind of sin, do the same kind of things, and guess what? You're going to have the same kind of results. Um, so when the men of Israel turned again, and the men of Benjamin, verse 41, were amazed, and they saw that evil was come upon them. Therefore they turned their backs before the men of Israel unto the way of the wilderness, but the battle overtook them. And them that came out from the cities they destroyed in the midst of them. Thus they enclosed Benjamites round about and chased them and trod them down with ease over against Gibeah toward the sunrise. Now we had two occasions where they they slaughtered the Israelites. 22,000 verse 21 and uh, 18,000 verse 25. And now it seems they'd be doing this with ease. When they got their order right and they got themselves right with God and they addressed God in the proper way to the proper priest um, with the proper means, then God said, they're yours. And when God's with you, it's pretty easy, isn't it? Uh, the Benjamites, uh, they fell of the Benjamites, 18,000 men. And uh, all these were men of valor. And they turned and fled toward the wilderness under the rock of uh, Rimmon. And they gleaned of them in the highways, 5,000 men, and pursued hard after them unto, unto guide them and slew 2,000 men of them. And so, wow. So all of which fell that day of Benjamin were 20 and 5,000 men that drew the sword. And all these were men of valor. But 600 men turned and fled into the wilderness unto the rock of Rimmon and abode in the rock of Rimmon four months. The men of Israel turned again unto the children of Benjamin and smote them with the edge of the sword as well the men of every city as as the beast and all that came to hand so that they set on fire all the cities that they came to. Hmm. So we read when this book started that they stopped doing that with their enemies. They left their enemies alive. They didn't kill them. And they didn't destroy their, their livestock. And they didn't burn their cities. They left them alive. And so, but now they are being pretty... Uh, um, pretty brutal with their bread. And because of their sin, we could understand that. But now they began to realize what's happened. And uh, the men of Israel had sworn in the Mizpah, saying, There shall not any of us, now listen carefully, give his daughter to Benjamin to wife. And the people came to the house of God and abode there till even uh, before God and lifted up their voices and wept sore and said, O Lord God of Israel, why has this come to pass in Israel that there should be today one tribe lacking in Israel? Do you see anything else here that they were adamant about in relationship to Benjamin that they were not adamant about in relationship to those other nations? The, the no, we're not going to give 
tried to argue to them, and why? Hmm. Now, God didn't tell them, don't give your, your sons and daughters to, to different tribes. He said, you utterly destroy these enemy. They almost did that with Benjamin. Uh, would have if they had caught all of them. Uh, and he said, do not give your daughters unto them, nor do you take their daughters unto your sons for wives. Now, they didn't do that with those nations, but all of a sudden they made this vow that they cannot break. Now, they can break God's vow. <laughs> they can break his commandment and say, uh, no, uh, we're not going to keep that. We like these women, and um, um, we're going to marry them. And we're not going to kill these people because they can be our servants. And, but now, all of a sudden, uh, they're going to stick with this vow they made. They're not going to give their daughters to Benjamin and wife. And again, maybe it's because of the hideousness of the sin that they feel like Benjamin has promoted and been part of. Um, but now they realize, okay, if there's only 600 men left and we've killed all the women. Think about that. When they were going from city to city and they had defeated the two kings on the other side of the river and 31 kings in this land, and they utterly destroyed man, woman, and children and burned the cities, they were successful. Because that's what God told them to do. Um, now they go against their own brethren and they kill the women. Now the sin that was committed didn't involve the women. But they kill the women. They kill everybody. And now they're no wives. And they're pretty much saying, what did we think about that? What did we think about that this would annihilate a tribe and that if we don't leave women alive, you know, even if we don't kill all the men, they're not going to survive. Benjamin, you know, out of fairness, could have been left to themselves, as we mentioned earlier, leave the 600 men to themselves and say, okay, uh, not only they which commit such sin are worthy of death, but they that have pleasure in them to do so, now you have your pleasure among yourselves. Uh, but they're realizing, you know, that reality is setting in, and uh, they know that um, God's promise is, um, was upon uh, descendants of Abraham, and it was represented in Jacob with these 12 tribes, and they realized there's going to be one of us that's not <coughs> non-existent because there are only 600 men left and no women. And uh, so they seem to want to know how to handle this. And the children of Israel said, Who is there among all the tribes of Israel that came not up with the congregation under the Lord? And they had made a great oath concerning him that came not up to the Lord at Mizpah, saying, He shall surely be put to death. The children of Israel re repented them for Benjamin, their brother, and said, There is one tribe out of Israel this day. Um, how shall we do for wise for them that remain, seeing we have sworn by the Lord that we will not give them our daughters wives? Had they sworn anything to the Lord before Joshua? We will serve Jehovah. They didn't keep that vow. And he said, What is it there of the tribes of Israel that came not up to Mizpah? And behold, there came not up to the camp of, uh, from Jabesh Gilead to the assembly. For the people were numbered. Um, behold, there were none of the inhabitants of, of Jabesh Gilead there. And the congregation sent thither 12,000 men. Um, and they go and smite the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead and, um, with women and children. And they utterly destroy every male and every woman that hath lain with a male. In verse 12, and they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead 400 young virgins that had known no man by lying with any male. And they brought them into the camp of Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. The whole congregation sent some to speak unto the children of Benjamin that were in the rock of Remon. And to call peacefully unto them, Benjamin came again at the time, and gave they gave them wives which they had saved alive of the women of Jabesh Gilead, and yet so they um, sufficed them not. Again, just the natural functioning of saying they're going to have to have wives ought to have shouted from the mountaintop. You ought to know that all along. Why do you pervert? God's natural order of things and commit a sin that God says is worthy of death when here you are 
You're not going to exist if you don't have wives. And they're even uh, kinder to the men than they deserve in the sense that they found them virgin. Why would you need a virgin? They took the concubine of the Levite and forced her. You know, why did you just find them any woman? You know, they treated them with greater purity and respectfulness than Benjamin deserves. Um, but they find them that many wives. There's only 400, so 200 guys don't have wives. And uh, don't know exactly how they decided which 400 got the first one. <laughs> Arm wrestling. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> They've been slingshots, you know. And some of them were good at a hair's breadth, and so uh, I say, yes, all right, go ahead and take it. Uh, but the whole congregation sent some to speak unto them, and they made this uh, arrangement with Benjamin, and the people repented them from Benjamin because the Lord had made a breach in the tribes of Israel. And the elders of the congregation said, How shall we do for wives then remain? So the women are destroyed. And so they go through this process of of um, knowing that there's a particular uh, uh, yearly uh, function at Shiloh and women come and dance and so they tell these finally involve the Benjamites themselves and uh, tell them to go and um, and uh, steal them some wives and uh, while these women um, are dancing and uh, they just to pick them out one I suppose and uh, throw them over their shoulders. That's it. Okay, man analogy. And, uh, and it was so. And when their fathers and their brethren uh, uh, come unto us to complain, they anticipate that that might not be the, the, the most diplomatic approach. Um, there was nobody else for them to kill. <laughs> and so uh, this goes still. And if your their fathers and brethren come up and complain, We'll tell them, look, we've made a mistake here, and there's a real complicated situation. Help us out. Is that essence and paraphrase version of what they're saying? Help us out here and and hold us guiltless because we're just trying to repair the life of our, our brother Benjamin, and uh, we've got to find them wives or they're not going to live. And when you read through all that, um, it concludes by saying. Uh, Everybody went back to their own inheritance. And in those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Not the first time you've heard that, is it? Uh, God wasn't king in Israel for most of the history we read about here in the book of Judges. So very bleak, dark time for them. A lot of ugly things happen. And that will always be the case when God is not the centerpiece of our lives. When we're not putting him first, we're not seeking first the kingdom of God, then there'll be a lot of dark moments. Um, our life and our sojourn here on this earth will have a lot of dark moments anyway, just because um, we're here and um, uh, we have limitations, and we have uh, death, and we have heartbreak. Um, but those of us who are in Christ and those of us who follow the word of God, we have hope in Christ. And we look beyond this earth. But if we leave God out, Ephesians chapter 2 says we are without God and without hope in the world. That's pretty dark, isn't it? And these folks were without God. And uh, so they had no direction and no hope. So I'm ready for a little more positive news. I don't know about you. And so we uh, started out the week, thankfully, looking at real positive leadership and success and triumph and so it's probably fitting that we fit in those sad times, um, and then we can close with looking at the book of Ruth. Um, when we see these people being preserved, that is Benjamin, um, we might think they really didn't deserve it, but we're at least appreciative of the fact that um, um, their brethren were conscious of them, and that when they did help them out, it was in God's order of things, and that is, these men were given wives, and uh, which ought to have indicated to everyone um, uh, the cost of sin. It cost the other tribes, it cost the tribe of Benjamin severely, it cost God's people as a whole their image of purity and, and trust in God, and... Uh, 
But when you get to the book of Ruth, uh, this third historical book in the Old Testament, um, it's named after that young Moabitess woman, the principal character in this book. Um, you have your, your uh, faith restored. And keep in mind, this records for us that this happened during the time of Judges. And so maybe the Lord's trying to get us to say, even when all those things are going on and all that dysfunction in, the, in this family of God, the Israelites, um, individual folks can do, still do right. And we need to hear things like that, don't we? We need to be reassured of those kind of things. The author is unknown, possibly it was Samuel. But we're not sure about that. The book derives his name, obviously, from, uh, from Ruth, that's the main character. Uh, the book records a period of time when the judges were ruling, um, which is helpful for us to know, so that we get some impression of uh, what time period it is. Uh, the theme of it as a whole is uh, personal insight into Ruth's life. It's very personal. You know, a lot of things we've studied up to now is, is uh, general in the sense of the nation. And we've looked at a few individuals along the way, and, but they are usually, their actions are usually directly connected to a nation. Um, this is uh, the personal life of, of Ruth. And the kinsman redeemer, the lineage of Christ through David, and we'll spend some time looking at that. It gives us, a, you know, the kind of insight <coughs> that we, we really need. The book is considered to be, you know, one of these literary masterpieces. It's written in such a, um, a skillful fashion. And, uh, you know, when you read it, you just, almost every line, you just kind of are spellbound. You know, it has something of intrigue when you read it. Um, it leads you along from uh, them fleeing for um, food in Moab to them returning to the promised land because food is there. Uh, but tragedy happens in the lives of, of um, uh, these people. Uh, Imelech in particular, who is from uh, the tribe of Judah, and we know something about uh, these tribes by now. The key thought is the beauty of courtship. You say, now wait a minute. You know, here are folks that are just uh, busy with life. Uh, Ruth's husband dies, her father-in-law dies, her brother-in-law dies. He has to take care of her mother-in-law. And she's gleaning in the field. How's that courtship? Well, we're going to, we're going to see that when this book closes. Uh, it pictures a family uh, uh, devotion, this unselfish attitude and generosity, great love and and simple trust in the Lord that's depicted in this uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 10 through chapter 3 and verse 18. Even in times of great tribulation, uh, life goes on, doesn't it? You have to put one foot in front of the other, and you have to do your best in life, and you can enjoy the process. Ruth seems to uh, find joy in the midst of all this suffering and sorrow. Uh, but she finds that because we have Naomi and Ruth devoted to the Lord, and Boaz who's devoted to the Lord. And this is a true love story. You want to assign folks who come to you for marriage counseling uh, a, a book that will tell them what marriage is all about and what life is all about, and yet it be romantic and beautiful, this is a good book to assign. And you can write down verses, and I do. And you can give them other assignments, and I do. But, uh, you know, this is kind of real life here. And uh, it turns out really well because of the focus each one of these has. There's probably few weddings that you've ever been to that you hadn't heard this passage. It's usually a man saying it to a woman and a woman saying it to a man. Um, but even those who use it don't always know that this was a daughter-in-law saying it to her mother-in-law. <laughs> Um, and she's asking Ruth not to, uh, rather Naomi, not to entreat her to leave thee, nor to return from falling after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and whither thou lodgest, I will lodge, and I will, uh, and thy people shall be my people, and thy God shall be my God. And she means it. Does it sound we like, say, I'm sorry, does that sound like pretty good wedding <laughs> vows, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. But when people say it, when people say it, 
Do they mean it the way Ruth meant it? If you say those words the way Ruth said them, and you mean them the way Ruth meant them, then you that's great to use. If they just sound, you know, um, uh, soft and beautiful, where the thou goest, I will go. Where the thou lodgest, I will watch. <laughs> thy people shall be my people, and thy God shall be mine. Yeah. Now look at each other's eyes, little sparkles go up, you know. Uh, but you see, uh, Ruth has already experienced life. She's already been married. She knows how fragile life is. And she has suffered greatly because of the consequences of life. She knows when she goes with Naomi, she's going to go to a place she's never been before. She knows she's going to live among people. She hasn't lived before. And she knows there's going to be sacrifice. These are two women whose husbands are dead. This is not two young people who are healthy and in love. This is two people who know what life's all about. And so if you know this person you're going to marry and you really mean it, wherever they go, I'm going to go there. Instead of, as soon as it's all over, he says, a few months say, honey, um, I've been transferred. I'm not leaving my mother and daddy. I thought we had that understood. Well, but you said whether you go, I will go. Well, I didn't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might you we might move across town, but I'm not moving out of state. I thought you knew how close I was with my mother and daddy. You see, those are beautiful words. Mm-hmm. And they are powerful uh, when they are really meant. This woman means it. Every word you read after those things are stated will underscore she meant it. And everybody around her will know she meant it. Her reputation will be staked upon her meaning. And when she's introduced or Boaz introduces himself to her, he'll say, here's what I've heard about you. The first thing he heard about her was, you came here with your mother-in-law. And you're out here in these fields gleaning for your mother-in-law. You are a stranger in our land. He knew why she was there. Because Naomi was there. Naomi stayed in Moab. Guess where Ruth lived in Moab? But she's in this land. And so, beautiful passage. And I encourage couples to use it. But I don't make them read through the book of Ruth first. And if you want to use it, wonderful. You know what it means. If you don't read through the book of Ruth, then don't go pick out some verses that sound so soft. Yes, sir. That, they should actually substitute the vows that we kindly use with this one. <laughs> yeah. You know? You know You'd like to do that when you you don't want to rain on their parade, but you'd like to follow it and say, Do you really know what you're saying? Do you know what those who said those words and what came afterwards, you know, like I'm all dressed up, I got my makeup on and and I've got this thing ready for a day. You know, don't take up my time bother me with truthful things, factual events. I don't perform a wedding ceremony, and about half of this class has already had my counseling class. I'm not going to teach it in these last few minutes. But uh, I require at least five weeks. I request seven weeks of their time before I will perform a wedding ceremony. Hmm. So I know what they know. And uh, they will know this because they're not going to come to me for uh, those sessions that I haven't ready. And... Uh, I'm not going to perform their ceremony if there's not evidence that they have ready. Then after that, if they don't take it serious, it's not because they don't know. Uh, it's because they've chosen to ignore it. Um, so I think this is, you know, these things are written in the four down read for our learning. This is a powerful one. Beautiful verses, but I dare say probably 80% of those couples do not know that Ruth said that to Naomi. <laughs> they just heard that wedding ceremony. It sounds really good, doesn't it? So, the book takes its place in the time of the judges. The famine is in Bethlehem. Calls Emelech, the, the uh, patriarch of this family, take his wife to Moab, and they have two sons, um, Malin and Chilon. And Emelech dies, and uh, Malin and, and Chilon take Moabite wives, and there seems to be about a 10-year period there uh, that the uh, 
where the sons took their wives, and then they died. And, um, and so the book opens up with describing that to us in chapter 1. Uh, Amalek's named, um, and uh, where he's from, those first two verses from Bethlehem. Uh, again, that becomes significant because this will be in the lineage of Christ. And where is Christ born? Bethlehem. These are not insignificant things. But it tells it about him, tells us who his sons were. And um, um, in very short order, verse 3 says, Naomi's husband uh, died, and she was left with her two sons. Uh, then they took wives from Moab. You see, where we move, more than likely, whoever we expose our children to, they're going to choose husbands and wives from that pool of people. And so they, they choose Moabite uh, wives. Um, and then they die. So it must have been a pretty brutal time. You know, famine takes place. And sometimes when famine takes place, the disease begins to run rampant. And people become physically frail. And, um, you know, uh, at any rate, we have three men die in pretty short order within a 10-year span there. And um, uh, she arose with her daughters-in-law and that she might return to her country uh, from the country of Moab. For she had heard that in the country um, of Moab how God had visited his people in giving them bread. What people? Her people back in Canaan. And so she'd heard that things had changed there and now they had bread. Why did they come to Moab? Looking for bread. <laughs> And it's not unusual when we're introduced to, to Abraham, there's some going and coming to Egypt because of bread and famine in different parts of the, of the world. Uh, when Jacob and his son go down to Egypt, it's because of famine. And so this is not unusual for people migrate where the food is. Um, when she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, they went up uh, to the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house, and the Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. That's a great compliment, isn't it, of daughter-in-laws? The Lord treats you kindly the way you treated the dead. Who's the dead? Emelech right. and Malin and Shiloh. And so they evidently were respectful of those men, and they had not abandoned her since their death. You showed me kindness. And so you go back to your families, and uh, she's wanting the Lord to bless them because of the kind of people they were. Um, the Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of your husband. Um, and then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And uh, they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. They both seem to be very devoted uh, to Naomi. That sounds different than how we describe our relationship with our in-law, doesn't it? You know, some of that I realize is just, uh, you know, uh, what we think we need to say, and we pick back and forth. And My mother-in-law passed away about a, a month ago, and, and uh, she was a you know, tremendous person and uh, a great mother-in-law. And uh, she was so kind to me and so good to me, I had asked permission before I tell a mother in law you know. Some of them are just too good to pass up, you know, they're just kind of classic things. And, and we kid each other about those uh, kind of relationships. But she was truly a good woman, did not interfere in our marriage, helped us in every way she could, and advice, and, but never barged in. And so you see a, a relationship that ought to exist in everybody. These women are devoted to their mother in law. And uh, they have the kindest respect for her, and she has seemingly respect for them, and uh, they want to go with her. Why? To take care of her. She's an old woman now. And uh, they want to go back with her to her people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any other sons in my womb? And that they may be your husbands? You see, she's looking at it from the Israelite standpoint, and it's required of them, you know, if... Uh, uh, a person deceased, then that next of kin, that brother, you remember Judah? In the last part of the book of uh, uh, Genesis,
Genesis. He gave one son after another and, and uh, finally uh, turned in unto his daughter-in-law because she deceived him, played the harlot, and, uh, um, and he had promised to give her the younger son. And he got of age and didn't do it. So that was the, the custom in her land. So she's saying, you go with me. Can I offer you anything for your future? No. Number one, my husband's dead. Number two, I'm old. And if I were to conceive today, would you wait? You know, that's not even realistic. And so she's saying, I don't have anything to offer you. There's no reason for you to go with me. And um, um, then he turned, they turned again, uh, turn again, my daughters, and go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. And if I should, I have hope if I should have any husband also tonight and should bear sons, would you tarry for them till they were grown? Would you stay for them from uh, having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. And so she kind of feels like this has all happened because of me. And now you're kind of uh, young women uh, who uh, don't have husbands. And, um, you know, that grieves me. And so you need to stay here. In essence, it's just saying you'd have a better opportunity to find a husband here among your own people uh, than to follow me around and take care of me. And um, she felt the Lord was against her. And she will make more than one reference to that. that. This would be bitterness because the Lord had showed her unkindness. And they lifted up her voices and wept and Oprah, um, uh, which was Challen's uh, wife, uh, kissed her mother-in-law and but Ruth clave unto her. Now, what do we say in wedding ceremonies? We refer back to Genesis chapter 2, and thus shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And so here are two passages already that we use uh, uh, emphasis from both. That is, where thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge, and uh, thy people shall be my people, thy God shall be my God. Now, her cleaving to her mother-in-law. In our marriage relationship, we cleave to each other. And so um, this is Ruth wanting to take care of her mother-in-law. She was really devoted to it. She said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back to her people and unto her gods. Well, was she conscious that there were gods in this land? No. She had mentioned God, her God, the God of Israel, Naomi's God, earlier. And um, um, now she's saying, uh, she wanted her God to bless them and she said your, your uh, sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her God return thou after thy sister-in-law and Ruth said entreat me not to leave thee nor to return from falling after thee uh, whither thou goest I will go and where thou lodgest I will lodge and thy people shall be my people and thy God shall be my God whither thou diest I will die and there will I be buried and the Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. We say anything similar to that, the last part of that in wedding ceremony? Until death do us part, and so help me God. The question is, we mean it. Um, and so that's why I wanted to read the book. I want them to see what real commitment is all about. And this wasn't based on some kind of infatuation or uh, unrestrained passion or uh, uh, sexual enhancement here. This was uh, true devotion and love for a person. If you can get that right, the other things are beautiful. If you base your marriage on those other things, life is not quite so beautiful. Um, so, after she's so passionate about it, um, and states it in such terms, um, when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So uh, they too went until they came into Bethlehem. And it came to pass that when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And um, they said, Is not this Naomi? And so you have Naomi returning to your homeland? after the death of her husband and uh, her sons, and Ruth is insisted upon being with her, and Naomi and Ruth uh, 
go back to the homeland and they settle in Canaan. And folks uh, remember Naomi, don't they? Um, Naomi's uh, kind of down on her um, image of God and kind of down on her image of herself, isn't she? Um, she said unto them, Call me not Naomi. They recognized her. And she said, Don't call me Naomi. I call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. And that's what Mara means. Bitter. Naomi means pleasant. And so when she left, she's a pleasant married woman. And uh, she comes back a bitter widow. <laughs> or at least uh, she felt like she'd been treated in a very bitter way. And God not been kind to her. And so don't even call me Naomi anymore. Mention a name that will remind me and you of the sorrow I suffered. Um, and so, uh, you know, a simple outline of the book causes us to see why they migrated there to start with. And uh, then we get to chapter 2 and it refers to uh, what happens since they're back in the land. As she returns with Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, verse 22, and um, into the out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Imelech, and his name was Boaz. We're about to commence, to begin, to start the process of courtship. And here's what I tell young couples, and I have young men sometimes come, and young women, you know, they really try to be good Christians. And um, we live in a society, and unfortunately sometimes in a, a societal environment in the church, where we put so much pressure on people to get married that we don't teach them what real courtship is. You know, we think it's this flirtatious thing and, and this infatuation thing and this you know this physical attraction thing. All those things are involved. We're not saying they don't exist. We're just saying that's not the essence of it. And so when I get folks to go read here and they come in and they say, you know, you know, I've, I've kept my life pure and, and I'm you know I've been faithful to the Lord and you know I just can't really find anybody that that, um, that I want to marry, you know, and it seems like slim pickings to them, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or they try to base their relationships on what our society is dictating the courtship, and, and they're not impressed with that, and they're disappointed in how uh, they're treated. Uh, and our congregations have developed single groups. <laughs> and that's a pool of people who are not married or looking for a spouse. And it gets uncomfortable for them. You know, because now you got to go find one. How many left? There's only five. Well, they're not really impressive. And we all sit around looking at each other and say, okay, who's not married? One of us is going to have to settle for a little less. That we're all that's left. <laughs> Isn't that the way we do it? <laughs> and people get married and say, we're really not the one I wanted, but that's the only one left. <laughs> you see, courtship is holding court. Yep. It's calling in all the witnesses. Witnesses are real life people mm -hmm. in our lives, asking all the right questions, listening to the answers, telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth will help us God. Where are you going to learn the truth? You're about to find out. Ruth keeps her word. She goes to her mother in law. She's back in land. It happened to be barley season. What does that mean? It worked. Mm -hmm. Now, I tell these young folks to come to me, you get busy working in the Lord's kingdom, and you're going to run right smack dab into somebody busy working in the Lord's kingdom. This story reveals such. They're going about life, they're sweating, and working every day to survive, and they meet each other in a real life context. Not at a single group. Not when everybody's showered, cleaned up, and prettied up, and, and looking for a wife or a husband. It's when they're really out taking care of life. And Ruth is that kind of person. She means what she says. She's kept her vow with her mother-in-law. And her mother-in-law is kind of down on her 
uh, image of life and she changed her name from the only pleasant one to Morrow Bitter One. And uh, she tried to encourage her. And, and it seems that Ruth, being from a heathen background, saw something in Naomi and her experience with her God that she was impressed with. Naomi don't seem to be quite as impressed with her God and her context as Ruth is. But Ruth seemed to really be impressed with Naomi and seemed to already have confidence in Naomi's God. And so when she gets there, she does what she says she's going to do. She goes with her and his barley harvest. And Ruth, the Moabites, listen to her now. She said, where are all the single men in Israel? You know what she said? She said, let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him who's, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. She went to work, didn't she? It's barley harvest. And it's, uh, it's time of harvest. And let me go into the fields and find us something to eat. You suppose she knew from conversations with Naomi that God built into the laws of his people that they would have to leave the corners of their fields and things that would fall by the wayside in the fields so that even the strangers could come and glean out of their fields. You suppose she knew that? She said, let me go glean in the field. Wherever I find favor. And so she must have listened to what Naomi said. She really means it. Your people are going to be my people. What's the custom of your people? She must have already known the custom is to leave those sheaves in the field. And you don't cut the corners. Or we might say cut the corners and leave the corners uh, for them to glean from. So uh, she knew where to go and what to do. And it was all because this was her people. And uh, this was Naomi's God's law. And she paid attention. And she's going about doing those things. She went and, and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hat was to light in the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who's uh, kindred of Emelet. Boy, you see any providence here? Now, before this book closes... We're going to have a real clear picture of Ruth being in the lineage of Christ. And here's a woe about his woman who doesn't have Abraham's blood flowing in her veins. But she's had Abraham faith in her life. And God uses her. You see, when you're encouraging young people that what real courtship is, let them understand that their marriage to Christ is much like Ruth's commitment to Naomi. That they're going to accentuate their relationship with the Lord and these other things work out. Everything works out for Ruth because she is focused on this commitment she's made to Naomi and to her God. And if we get busy in the Lord's service that way and we accentuate our marriage to Christ and that's what our focus is and we're out gleaning in the fields and you know the Lord said to the disciples one time, don't say there yet four months and then come at the heart. Just lift up the eyes. You see, so as soon as I get married, we're going to really be faithful to the Lord. And I, if I can marry a good Christian husband, then we're going to dedicate ourselves to the Lord. And if I can marry a, a good Christian wife, then, then I'm going to, me and my wife are going to be evangelistic in the Lord's service. Well, how do I know that? If you're not doing any of that now, how would I know that? Ruth's doing exactly what she said she would do. Notice who notices. <laughs> and behold, Boaz came to the singles group that night. <laughs> Behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Good relationship with those folks that work with him and for him, doesn't he? He's not a tyrant. He's not taking advantage of them. Um, he has trust of them, and they're speaking kindly to each other. Um, then said Boaz unto his servants, uh, That was said over the reapers, who damsel is this? It kind of tells you Boaz was an astute kind of person. When he came and checked on the reapers, he checked on the reapers. Here's a new person. And he said, whose is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, it is the Moabitess damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. Is word getting around? That she'd been standing around here asking what all the men were. <laughs> In fact, he's going to say just the opposite. He said she came back from Moab, from Moab with her, uh, with Naomi. And she said, I pray you, 
Let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from morning until now. And she tarried a little in the house. Now, if you go visit some young lady's household, and she lets her mother do all the cooking, all the preparation, and she sits around and does nothing, you better hold court. You better pay attention to the evidence. Nothing is said here about courtship. Boaz didn't say, I'll be right back. I'm going to get flowers and candy. He said, who is this? And he said, here's who she is. And she came out here early this morning. She asked permission to be here. And she's been here all day long. She took a small break. And she's back. You think Boaz filed that away? You keep reading in the story. And these couples have to read the story. See, if they come to me, they don't read the story. And if they've gone home with each other and they said, the mother said, Honey, come at me. I am not going to set the table. I'm in here holding hands. Then the old guy said, She loves me more than she does her mother. You better pay attention. (laughs) That's only temporary. (laughs) Because your mother in law is not going to be there cooking for you. She's going to be sitting here holding your hand. You're going to be hungry. (laughs) (laughs) All of a sudden, that sweaty palm is not going to nourish you. (laughs) You're going to say, uh, And what's for dinner? You're going to say, I don't know. Where are you going to go? You see what happens to us? And we have developed this courtship where we just sit around and think nice thoughts. When courtship really ought to be experiencing life and say, how do people function in life? Who are they really? And then pay real close attention to the evidence that we see and make sure it's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And here's the truth being told. Ruth is not putting on the front. She's not pretending to be somebody she's not. She's keeping her word to her mother-in-law. What does she say? I'm going to go where you go. I'm going to lodge where you lodge, and your people are going to be my people, and I'm not going to leave you or forsake you. Well, she's not doing that. Then it said, and then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from thence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. For I have, for have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art thirsty, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Wow. Uh, he didn't say, you don't have to work anymore. Uh, he didn't say, are you doing anything tonight? Did he? No. You know, here, here we are. We've been trained and conditioned and say, all right, guys, here's how you do it. You know? No, you get busy and you go on about life and just watch what happens in life. How do people function? Can they function? Will they function? If they do, you might say, you know, we function pretty well today. We're getting on in life and, and we're accomplishing things and this is the way it ought to be. Um, Ruth is touched by that. You know, she's a uh, um, very humble kind of person. And um, he said, no, you should go into another field. You know, there's plenty here, and you just follow these maids around, and I'm going to get instructed as men to leave you alone. Uh, that ought to be comforting. You know, she didn't say, don't be telling me who I can. See who I can. <laughs> you know what I mean? Don't tell the men to leave me alone. That's what I came here for. I'm looking for a man. Isn't this a single group? Uh, he said, I told him to leave you alone. And she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? That's a good question, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Why have I found grace in thine eyes? Hmm. I didn't think there was any grace in the Old Testament. <laughs> she knew what grace was, didn't she? She said, I don't deserve this. Why are you showing me such kindness? I'm a stranger. All right. Now she's learning something about Naomi's God and Naomi's people. God built into his people this act of kindness and benevolence. And uh, she's going to be impressed. You see, if we're functioning that way in our Christian lives, it ought to be impressive to people. 
And uh, uh, Ruth is impressed. Uh, a Moabite is a foreigner in Israel. And she recognized that. She didn't pretend to be something she's not. She didn't pretend to be an Israelite. She pretended to be only who she was. And that is somebody who truly cared about her mother-in-law and was keeping her vow. And Boaz answered. Listen to his answer. See if this is courtship. And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thy husband. Had he checked with any witnesses? Had he gotten any evidence? And how that thou hast left thy father and thy mother in the land of thy nativity and are coming to a people which thou knewest not either to for. Anything not true so far? Has he got all the evidence? What's he impressed with? The fact that this woman has lost her husband and she's come to take care of her mother-in-law. He's got it down. He said, it's been showed me. Um, you know, whole different scenario of what we have as courtship today. You see, you have to pay attention to how people really function and who they really are. Boaz received some intelligence here, hasn't he? Yep. He has some intel that he has collected and um, about the good deeds of this woman. That's what we ought to be impressed with. We certainly have uh, preferences as individuals about um, people's physical attractiveness and what may be attractive to me may not be attractive to you. And some of those things are just natural with us. Some of those things have been influenced by our society. But we ought to be more impressed with the character of the person. And we ought to say, that's a real person. Who would, if they'll take care of their mother-in-law that way, what kind of wife are they going to be? Wow. You know, that's what you ought to be paying attention to. Uh, the Lord recompense thy work. You see, if you encourage young people to go work for the Lord, he said, the, the Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given unto thee of the Lord God of Israel. Now, whose God is she going to serve? Mm -hmm. Naomi's God. Who is that? The Lord God of Israel. And so now Boaz said, let him recompense thy work and reward thee unto whose wings thou art come to trust. Is that true? Absolutely. Uh, she said, your God's going to be my God. Who is she trusting? Your field, let me go glean for us. Why? Because your God set it up that way. And uh, so she's trusting. It's going to work out okay. May God bless you. Abundantly is what he said. And she said, let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for thou hast comforted me. For thou hast spoken friendly unto thy handmaid, though I be not likened unto one of thy handmaids. I'm a foreigner, and you treat me like someone that you know, and someone that you've cared for, and someone who's cared for you. And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime, come out thou hither and eat bread, and dip the morsel in vinegar, and she sat beside the reapers, and he reached uh, her parchment corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. And she didn't hang around and say, So, are you married? <laughs> uh, this will be okay. I might not have to work anymore. You see, we kind of condition ourselves to think that way. And that's just not what's happening here. This is real courtship where they're calling in all the evidence. And I got behind here, didn't know my, um, uh, my context. But they're calling in all the evidence and looking back on these things. And we'll go about 15 minutes and we'll, we'll take another break. Um, but she was uh, risen up to glean. And Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves and the fruit were not. See, they were supposed to just pick up what had, been, had fallen off the wagons or uh, on the ground or in the corners. And uh, he said, you let her come among the sheaves. You let her be part of the harvest itself um, and reproach her not. You see, these people who were watching out for Boaz's interest would have typically not let that strangers come in and glean among the sheaves. They'd let them pick up what was left, but this was for their families and for their livelihood. And so you couldn't just have 
strangers coming and gleaning your crops or harvesting your crops. They'd have to glean in the field. And let fall also some handfuls of purpose for her. What does that sound like? You knock it off on purpose, you know? You drop it on the ground so she'll be sure to find it and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. You might not find this guy in a single group, but wow, what a guy to, uh, to meet. Boaz uh, is wealthy, and um, um, he is a right kind man, isn't he? What's, what's Ruth's impression of him so far? It doesn't say he was tall, dark, and handsome. What did it say? He was honest, and kind, and generous. And... Isn't that what the evidence is saying? We don't know what he looked like physically. What does our society focus on? We, we focus on the physical appearance of folks, don't we? And I'm certainly not you know, diminishing that, but that's not what we read here. We know something about the character of both of these people by their actions. Uh, she gleaned in the fields and didn't eat. She didn't, she didn't say, this is going to be a cushy ride here. Well, she did. Still gleaning. Uh, she's appreciative of the kindness. Um, she's impressed with the man, but she stays working. Um, and it was about uh, an ephod of barley. And so very generous. And she took it up, and when she went into the city, uh, her mother-in-law saw that she had gleaned, and she brought forth and gave to her, and she had reserved after she had sufficed. And so um, she making sure her mother-in-law is taken care of because that's what she promised. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today? Where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought and said, The man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. That's all most romantic, isn't it? You know, when we run home and tell our parents, say, we're going to tell them their name. Uh, but you see, she's in Naomi's country, and she's gleaning in the fields of Naomi's uh, relatives, and uh, she doesn't know them, but she assumes Naomi will. And so she said, where'd you glean? And she told her. Um, and Naomi said unto her, daughter-in-law, blessed be the Lord who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, This man is near of kin to us, one of our next kinsmen. Wow. Now, when we're calling in all the witnesses, <coughs> and we're collecting all the evidence, and we're asking all the right questions. Any questions being asked here? Anybody paying attention to the answers? Ah, you know who he is? No, but let me tell you what it looks like. You know, none of that happened. He said, His name was Boaz. Oh, darn them all. Let me tell you who he is. The Lord's been kind. And who did Naomi's, uh, who did Ruth say she was going to serve? Naomi's God. Let me tell you who he is. Why would she say that the Lord has been gracious, kind unto the living and to the dead? Who living would the Lord have been kind to in this deed, this story? Naomi and Ruth. Uh, Both of them. All right. Uh, Naomi and Ruth both. Um, they're the living. Why did he say the Lord had been kind? They had food to eat today. How did the Lord teach his disciples to pray? Give us this day our daily bread. We're eating today. Why wow, the Lord has been gracious to us? And to the dead. How is he gracious to the dead? Amen. To carry on the name. All right. This nearest of kin. Uh, not didn't say he's nearest to kin, said he's kin. He's a near kin. Um, and God has set up a system where the nearest of kin would take on that responsibility. And so she's saying of all the places you could glean, you're gleaning in the field of someone who is near kin to us. And so our husbands um, uh, will provide for us, can provide for us through the, to the nearest of kin. And Ruth the Moabite said, he said unto me also, and she didn't go home telling about what this man looked like, but since it was brought up, and since we're talking about the subject, said, and he said to me also, 
that thou shalt keep fast by my young men until uh, they have ended all my harvest. Is that true? Yeah. See, we're paying attention here. And we're getting all the evidence. And he, she's saying, here's what he said. You see, sometimes we come home from our dates and we don't tell our parents anything. Why? We don't want them to know. And uh, this is not a date. This is a real life happening. She comes home and says, this is really what happened? Why? Because they only would know whether this is proper or improper. She'd know if this is wise or unwise. So she's saying, here's what he told me. Naomi said unto Ruth, Here, my daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that thou uh, go out with his handmaids, that they meet thee not in any other field. What does he say? That's the right thing. He said, you can stay until harvest time. Don't look for another field to glean in. You see, Ruth is wanting that kind of advice and guidance. If, through that courtship of our day, if uh, young men and young women aren't paying attention to any of the advice of their parents, you ought to pay attention to that. That's not a good sign. You think, well, they love me more than other parents. Not a good sign. Uh, need to pay attention to that. And so she's wanting to know what to do, and Naomi is advising her. Does she do what she's told to do? Yeah. So she kept fast by the maiden. Why? Boaz told her she could. Naomi said she should. But what did she do? What she advised to do. Um, the maidens of Boaz to glean until the end of the barley harvest and uh, of the wheat harvest that dwelt with her mother-in-law. So what happened? She just kept on working. What would happen if a young man called and wanted to uh, and we would say go out with a young lady and they you know, they were courting as they define it and the parents said no we've got chores to do and there's work we're trying to accomplish and they can't go think that okay I understand that typically doesn't work that way we try to manipulate and get them to beg or we say okay hey, just throw a fit tell them you're going anyway or uh, whine about it until they just get tired of listening to you and they let you go. Or just sneak off and we'll go in the way. Everything opposite of what we read here. She goes out there in that field and she gleans every day until when? Until there's no more gleaning time. What, what kind of person is going to keep that vow and say, Whither thou goest, I will go, and whither thou lodgest, I will lodge? Thy people shall be my people, and thy God shall be my God. Where thou diest, I will die. Where thou buried, I will be buried. You don't say that. Somebody don't do it until life is over. Until harvest is no more. And so, how do you know they'll do that? You're going to have to look in the context where they live. And you can't do that in our definition of courtship. Because it's superficial. It's conjured up. It's artificial. It's not real life. You can't go watch movies all the time. You've got to work for a living. You know, you can't sit around and not ever perspire. You have to go out and work <coughs> and accomplish. And so that's what we have here. I'll tell you one little story in two minutes, and those who've had the counseling class um, will we'll just hear it the second time. But... Um, when my wife and I were dating, um, I didn't pay real close attention in school, and so uh, spelling had never been one of my strengths. But I was really smitten by my wife, and I took um, music classes because that's where all the girls were, and that's where you know I could spend time with my wife, and I could sing just good enough to make the chorus, the high school chorus that traveled around, and so you got to spend lots more time together, but the music teacher said we had to attend so many practices we couldn't travel, and I thought that meant everybody was me. And after all, I played football, and, and he surely wouldn't leave me at home. He did. They went off on this chorus trip without me, so I was heartbroken, and I wrote her a, a love note. And I intended to call her my sweetheart. And I used it multiple times in my note. And each time I spelled sweetheart. 
<laughs> she's very kind and very diplomatic. And so when she got back, you know, and we were together again, she you know, thanked me for the sweet note. Sweet. And she emphasized sweet note. And she said, I don't want to embarrass you, but because I care about you, I want you to know that sweet is spelled with two E's. <laughs> I, would, I could feel myself, well, I'm probably blushing now, you know. I could feel myself blush. I thought, I can't believe I did that. I called her my sweat. Now, here's the moral to the story. Here's the rest of the story. Is that that woman has given birth to my children. That woman has done every imaginable work you could imagine. She's driven U-Haul trucks. She can drive a tractor. She can work in the field. She can cook on a wood stove. She has perspired on my behalf more than I can even describe to you. And so now, on purpose, I know how to spell sweet now, mm-hmm. but on purpose, when I want to acknowledge to her that I really do love her and I appreciate her, I buy her a card or a flower or one of her favorite author's books and I write inside of it, you are my sweetheart. Anybody be a sweetheart. It takes a person who really is committed and devoted to be a sweetheart. Ruth was a sweetheart. She got out there early and she stayed late. Why? Because she meant the vow she made to her mother-in-law. You see, you want someone who has that kind of commitment. My oldest son was in high school, and I taught him all to drive on this old 66 pickup truck that I that I got when my father died. And his old tree on the tree, you know, and and um, so that's all they could drive. They had to learn how to drive it, and that's all they could drive. I said, well, we're going to buy him a car. And um, so anyway, he asked this young lady to go get a coat with him after a ball game one night, after a football game. And he called me on the phone and said, Daddy, the truck broke down. And um, so I said, I'll be right there. And so I went to meet him, and I asked where the young lady was. And he said, her daddy came and got her. And uh, so we were up under the truck. You know, that model vehicle, you know, it's real simple. And so you can pretty much take bailing wire and repair anything. And so we were up under the truck fixing whatever had broken. And... Uh, so he's holding the flashlight, and he was just a fussy. You know, he said, just a piece of junk. I'm not going to ever be able to get a decent girl. What girl is going to ever go out and meet him? Just a piece of junk. And I said, you know where your mother would be if the truck had broken down? He got kind of quiet. He said, holding this flashlight. I said, that's exactly where she'd be. So if you have a young lady that... You know, it's got to always be the vehicle working smoothly. Nothing can ever break down. Nothing can ever go wrong. <clears throat> You're not going to have someone who's helped me in life. It's not going to happen. You see, we need to be able to teach those kind of lessons along the way. That's why I require them to read the book of Ruth. If you're going to come meet Mary Council, you're going to know something about Ruth. Because she was a real sweetheart. I mean, she didn't mind perspiring. Guess who saw her out in the field clean? The man we're going to read in the next two chapters who becomes her husband. He didn't see her all dressed up in the prom dress, taking the pretty pictures and have them kind of enhanced so that there are no blemishes. You know, oh, I can't answer the door until all my hair is just right. Where is she? Out there where the sun is hot, where the wind is blowing, and where the dust and grit gets on your skin. And she's out there every day. And that servant of Boaz says she got here early. She has been here all day. She took one real short break. Now, is he calling in the witnesses? Is he listening to all the testimony? Are they telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Now, fellas, that's courtship. That's really what courtship is, holding the court. What powerful witnesses these folks are. We'll take a break and come back and see if we can pick up there. Finish up. Let's take about a five minute break and then we'll probably go to about uh, 6 30 and hopefully we'll be through by then, okay? That works, everybody. Thank you very much. A little short.